Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome to the Institution of Engineering and Technology's John Logie Baird Lecture Event for 2019. Uh, my name's Barry Flynn. I'm a lecturer and program leader at the University of Westminster in London, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, this year, the event takes the form not of a lecture, uh, but of a panel discussion entitled Who's Watching Who? The idea being that we've moved from a situation in which TV was mainly about broadcasters sending messages, messages to us to one in which the direction of flow seems to have been partially reversed. Um, and we have an illustrious panel of experts from Sky, Ofcom, Think Analytics, and the world of TV consulting to discuss that issue and what it means for us in the TV sector. Um, before we do that, my first duty is to um, tell you about a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, one is that you should be aware that there is no planned fire alarm practice tonight. So if you do hear a fire alarm, run like hell. Um, and the exits are as marked um, either side here. And I think there may be some at the back either side as well. Um, and the other thing that you should do is if you do run like hell, you should end up under Waterloo Bridge, uh, where you'll receive further instructions. Um, the other thing is, um, could you um, please switch off your mobiles if you haven't already? It's a reminder to myself, I think. Um, yeah, it is off. Um, uh, before I introduce the panel, and since the IET does uh, have the word technology in its title, I wanted to quickly trace how the modern broadband-enabled pay TV distribution network developed and what it looks like today in terms of the various data flows it enables. Um, I've chosen pay TV uh, not just because Sky is on the panel tonight, um, uh, but because in the TV sector, it was the pay TV operators who were really the first gatherers of personally identifiable information, or PII, um, about viewers and their behavior. Um, I emphasize I'm no engineer, um, so this will be a very simplified sort of helicopter view of pay TV network evolution, um, ordered into a historical sequence, um, which is a bit bogus because in fact, every pay TV operator in, um, in, in every country or every different country had a slightly different path um, towards um, uh, turning themselves into an advanced broadband enabled network. Um, anyway, um, as I'm sure um, you know, um, Initially, the whole thing uh, before the fall uh, was entirely one way. Um, and you um, uh, have here a diagram of a uh, satellite pay TV uh, broadcaster on the left and um, a subscriber home on the right. And um, the broadcaster encodes a TV signal, sends it via an uplink to the satellite, which bounces it down to a dish in the home. Um, and this passes it down to a satellite set top box, which decodes a signal and passes it onto the subscriber's TV set. And um, that's controlled um, by the um, viewer using a remote, which passes instructions to the set top box. OK, so that was, um, you know, the um, ab origine um, set up for a, for a pay TV operator right at the beginning. Um, in this first stage, the pay TV operator probably gathers um, well, definitely gathers personal information from subscribers at the point of sign up. Um, and of course, knows what package of content they're paying for and will keep a record of any changes requested, for instance, to the tiers um, being selected and paid for. Uh, but that data set is pretty much all it has to go on um, unless it's offering a pay-per-view movie service, which in the early days, um, and not, not all of you, of course, will remember this, but I do, uh, would have allowed the subscriber to order a movie by simply phoning up the pay TV operator and asking for the relevant channel to be unscrambled. Um, uh, this, of course, offered an additional data source relating to view viewing preferences, which could be added to the subscription management systems database. In the second stage, it became possible to add an analog modem to the set-top box in order to connect it to um, the uh, public switch television, uh, television, telephony network, PSTN, um, and back to the operator. In other words, to provide a return path for data, albeit a narrow band one. 
Um, this had two apparent advantages. Uh, it had been discovered that allowing the subscriber to automatically order a pay-per-view movie over the phone network by just clicking on the remote um, significantly increased movie buy rates. Um, perhaps much more importantly, it allowed the pay-TV broadcaster to collect data from the set-top box. That's to say, perhaps um, what the subscriber had been viewing, or perhaps the um, set-top box's performance. Um, the importance attached to this new source of data can be gauged by the fact that in Sky's case, plugging the set-top box into the phone line became a condition of being able to um, receive the service. Although um, I think Simon um, has some information to share about what the real reason um, for, for, for that might have been. Um, so uh, what happened in the third stage? So we've now got a narrow band um, enabled return path collecting data from the viewer. Um, uh, the third stage centers around the addition of broadband and that was a bit, a bit more complex. Um, so I generalize and compress a lot, um, but initially this was not part of the pay TV operators network, of course. Consumers access data or content of one kind or another from whoever they wanted to on the open internet. At first, low bandwidth stuff like email, text and graphics, and then as download speeds increased, audio and eventually video in the form of free catch-up TV. Not only did the pay TV operator not control this network, it had no control of the content either, or indeed the devices used to consume it. Uh, laptops, um, games consoles initially, uh, and then um, PCs and um, mobiles and tablets, and eventually TVs, of course. Um, these devices, unlike set-top boxes, which were managed by the pay TV operator, um, and indeed mostly owned by the pay TV operator, were purchased by consumers through retail outlets instead of being rented from the operator. The, ne the next two developments, again, um, this is very compressed, were that pay TV operators started connecting their set-top boxes to the household's broadband link, vastly increasing the amount of data they could upload from it over the internet, allowing them to considerably enrich their knowledge of subscriber behavior. It might not have been technically possible to capture every single keystroke on a remote control before in real time, but it certainly became possible now if you wanted to do that. The second thing that happened was that triple play players evolved. Um, so in some cases, pay TV operators did start managing um, a broadband network, um, if not the Wi-Fi network as well inside the home. Um, in the case of advanced cable networks, of course, this was already kind of all merged together and, and operating. The third thing that happened um, in reaction to the set success of free and eventually paid for OTT services, um, and in an, an attempt to recapture the viewing, and in some cases of subscribers that had migrated to them, they launched their own on-demand online video services for their subscribers. Initially receivable on their own managed set-top boxes, and eventually on the other unmanaged screens in the home uh, as well, when technology allowed all the um, DRM and security issues to be ironed out. So that's roughly where we, we stand today. Um, the point I'm making in, in, this, in this diagram is that it is technically possible, at least in theory, to harvest data about consumer behavior, whether it's PII or aggregated data, from every single red arrow or network segment on this diagram. Technically possible. Um, whether it's useful data in every case or not, or indeed whether it's legal to access it or not, is another story, which we're going to start exploring in a minute, I hope. But technically, it would be possible. A few observations. What's inside this little cloud icon, i.e. the internet, um, is what's made the whole data landscape balloon recently, in recent years, with hundreds if not thousands of third-party players who are each creating data about the behavior of the operator's subscribers for their own purposes. 
Just to cite a few of the dozens of interested constituencies, there are the social media platforms where viewers talk about, discuss and share the TV content they're interested in. There are the catch-up TV or SVOD players whose content is being consumed willy-nilly. Um, the content distribution networks or CDNs across whose platforms most of the high quality TV content is flowing and all sorts of companies doing clever things by correlating individual and aggregated data. For instance, um, I've, I've made a mention there of TV Squared at the top, which is a company that uh, matches the surge in website activity when a brand is advertised in an ad break and it matches it using machine learning. Um, so that shows you very precisely um, that consumers take a certain action with regard to the brand when they've seen it on a television screen. Um, so that, th th there are hundreds of really clever little companies like that finding out interesting things by gathering various kinds of data, um, um, whether it's, um, well, perhaps whether it's legal or not, but I, um, that doesn't apply to anybody on this screen, of course. Um, so, um, so that, that's, that's point one, is, is that, that there's a whole lot of players out there who are not in any way actually connected to the pay TV operator, but who have an interest in seeing what's happening in pay TV homes. Um, the, the, the second point is that this moves the whole industry away from sending data flows over owned and managed networks to one where the data is traveling over non-owned and non-managed networks. Um, there are also an awful lot more links in the chain here, and the security mantra is you're only as secure as your, leak your leakiest link, your weakest link. You're only as secure as your weakest link. It would seem that this more complex set of data flows is by definition a lot more vulnerable to security breaches. And GDPR penalties mean that you could now be put out of business if you suffer um, a severe hack. Third point, it's no longer just the pay TV people who acquire data from consumers on sign up. Over the past couple of years, free to air broadcasters have been starting to ask viewers of their online services to register, that is to say to supply PII, um, in order to use their online services. And they're therefore building what are in effect subscriber management systems of their own. Slowly but surely, they're also asking occasionally for payments for some of their online services. So in reality, the FTA crowd's um, needs to populate their databases with viewer behavior today is really not that different to a pay TV operator's. Fourth point, when, mus when using a media server to stream OTT services to a consumer device, the broadcaster potentially has access to census level data about the audience watching a particular program, uh, not just sample data from say 10,000 representative homes. Um, that, that offers data to TV companies with near zero um, uh, errors in the data collected because it's a server recording every single um, video stream served by, by it to a defined IP address. Um, another minor point perhaps is that media companies have histori historically kept um, data in silos, in some cases uh, for legal reasons, because they're not allowed to pass data between the two, but doesn't that prevent you from correlating data between the silos? Um, uh, the last point, which, um, I, uh, which I'm sure we'll, we'll, we will discuss tonight, is how do we keep recommendation engines honest? The idea is that such an engine analyzes what I watch and objectively provides me with recommendations that are gonna be relevant to me, increasing my viewing and engagement. But what about when the operator has an interest in promoting an original production that they have heavily invested in? I'm sure some of those issues will be touched on um, in what's gonna to happen tonight. So let me introduce our first speaker. Um, it is Jamie West, who's group director at Sky Advertising. Um, he's got over 20 years of TV and online sales experience, is deputy MD and director of strategy and capability at Sky's ad sales division. He leads the Sky Advanced Advertising Strategy, both at a product and commercial level, and is responsible for driving data, digital, and addressable TV revenues across Europe. Um, 
Jamie, would you like to come up and um, begin your presentation?